Good evening and a good new year to NNA. I'm Eric Walker, Chair of Highlands Astronomical Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome club members and especially our new members who joined over the festive period. Also, visitors from our North of Scotland Sister Astronomy Club. Now, tonight's timings are the same as always. I'll do this short welcome and uh, a, a little bit about the club. Um, we'll then have the main talk, followed by questions and answers. Uh, after the main talk, uh, half past eight or just after, Pauline will be delivering the club news, our astrophotographs and targets for observing this month. And around about nine o'clock or just after, um, we'll wrap up and it'll take us to the meeting close. Now, there won't be any breaks during the meeting, but if you need to leave for any reason, just get up and go, but keep yourself connected to the meeting. It's always a lot easier that way. Well, her activities, I looked at the introduction I gave at last year's January meeting, and, you know, I could just as well have cut and pasted that introduction and delivered it here today. The, the weather has played havoc with our practical observing opportunities, and I personally have had very, very limited observing sessions over the past couple of months, due mainly to clouds or mist. There have often been opportunities between 2 a.m. and sunrise, but uh, you'd have to be extremely keen or mad to regularly take up these opportunities. Anyway, despite the generally poor weather, we have managed to take quite a few superb photographs, which Pauline will show you later. Notwithstanding, Highlands Astronomical Society and its members have been industrious, and there are uh, a few achievements worth mentioning. Several members have been investing in new equipment and are taking great delight in letting everyone know via our WhatsApp groups and email reports what it is they've uh, been getting up to. This has probably contributed significantly to the infinite cloud cover that we have been experiencing. Again, uh, I personally have been using the downtime to service and recommission old redundant equipment that was just sitting in my workshop. And I've also been designing and 3D printing, observing and astrophotography accessories for some of our members so that they can get the best of out, out of their equipment when the clear skies undoubtedly do arrive in the next couple of months. Finally, I'd like to thank Sigma for organising and delivering an excellent Christmas quiz, which turned out to be as competitive and entertaining as last year. Great fun and fantastic to have different clubs from across the north of Scotland represented. And so back to tonight's shindig. I'm going to introduce our main speaker for tonight, Dr. James Blake. Now, James is a research fellow at the University of Warwick's new Centre for Space Domain Awareness, CSDA. With a background in optical astronomy, he has spent the past few years applying astronomical tools and techniques to the problem of space debris. Much of his work has involved the repurposing of astronomical instruments in La Palma, in the Canary Islands, to observe satellites and survey the night sky for untracked fragments of debris. The Space Age, it's opened up a wealth of opportunities, but sadly, a great deal of mess has accrued in our wake. In this talk, James will give us the current picture of the debris environment and explore the challenges and merits of potential solutions to the problem that has been, uh, that have been proposed in recent years. With our club members' interest in observational astronomy and especially astrophotography, I'm sure there's a fair bit of relevance in this talk for us amateurs. If you're interested in space missions, the ISS and such like, then I'm positive this will be for you. If you have any questions or comments, 
could you please type them into the Q and A box anytime during James' presentation, and we'll pick them up after his talk. It's with great pleasure I welcome James here tonight, and here he is to talk about the sticky issue of space debris. Over to you, James. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, bear with me while I just share my screen. So I'll go on to that. Okay, yeah, so as Eric was saying, um, I'll be talking about the sticky issue of space debris. So um, probably quite a different topic to what um, you're, you're used to, uh, but hopefully a very relevant one um, and certainly very topical. The, the good thing about this subject is that every single time um, I give a talk, there's always something recent in the news uh, that I can point towards. And, and this time round, um, I'm sure many of you have heard about the recent Russian ASAP test uh, that, that was conducted. Um, this was uh, an article published in November at the time. Um, and this was uh, the, the latest in what's been quite a long line of anti-satellite um, testing over the decade since the dawn of the space age. And uh, we'll revisit that slightly later in the talk. Um, but yeah, just to give a, a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. So I'll start off with a brief history um, of the problem in general and um, hopefully a few milestones along the way you'll recognize as part of the, the space age in general. Um, I'll then talk about the current picture, so uh, where we're at at the moment and what the problems are that we're facing. I'll then look at some of the proposed solutions to those problems. Um, and then finally, I'll start looking into uh, some of the projects that we have going on at the University of Warwick, uh, where I'm a postdoc. So without further ado, I'll get started, but I wanted to start off with a brief note on orbits, because um, I'm aware uh, that uh, some people might not be as familiar as others with the different terminologies that are used throughout. Um, so just to make sure that everybody's on the same page before we start. So something I'll be referring to quite often is LEO. Uh, LEO, or low Earth orbit, uh, refers to anything below 2,000 kilometers altitude. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, certainly on an astronomical scale, but even uh, in terms of much closer to Earth, that's actually quite a close spherical shell around the Earth. Um, so that's what I'm referring to there with LEO. I'll also be mentioning GEO um, along the way, and this will refer to what we call geosynchronous orbits. Um, these are much further out at about 36,000 kilometers. Um, and the key uh, or unique property of these orbits is that uh, things remain uh, synchronized with the rotation of the Earth. And so if you were to um, point your antenna on the Earth, up at your uh, geo geosynchronous satellite, um, then if it's purely geostationary, so um, completely synchronous and uh, equatorial, um, then it will be fixed in, in the sky for you. Um, some, some of the others that aren't exactly synchronized um, will actually uh, kind of trace a, what we call an analemma, figure of eight and ellipse on the sky. But the key point is that they stay roughly localized in your sky, and that's a very useful property. There's also medium Earth orbit, uh, highly eccentric orbits, and even UFOs, we do actually use that as, a, as a, um, an official term to describe anything that's undefined. So we might have data for something, um, but not quite enough to be able to tell what the orbit is exactly, um, or we may have lost track of it, um, and these things go into the catalogues as, as UFOs. But the main two that I'll be talking about are LEO and GEO moving forward. So to start off our brief history, I'll start in 1957, as many of you all know, uh, sort of by, considered by many to be the dawn of the space age when Sputnik 1 was launched. Um, and this uh, highlights one of the first causes of debris, actually, um, because although Sputnik 1 uh, actually re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, um, the satellites that have followed, very many thousands of, of satellites and, and objects that have followed since, um, some of which are still remaining in space doing nothing. So they've served their primary mission and they are just abandoned um, in their given orbit, um, some, of, some of which will be indefinitely, some will be spiraling in um, towards the Earth's atmosphere to re-enter uh, because of the drag that the atmosphere imparts on them. Um, and so this highlights one of the major causes, which is dead spacecraft. We, we do tend to abandon um, spacecraft and we're starting to try and get better at that and, and start to actually uh, reduce, reuse, recycle as we, as we like to do on Earth. But moving forward to 1961, this highlights another key date in the history of space debris. Um, so this was the first 
uh, accidental breakup. Um, and by breakup, I'm talking about explosions in orbit, so fragmentation events. Um, so this occurred when a four able star upper stage had deposited its payload, um, and shortly afterwards, a couple of hours afterwards, it uh, exploded and fragmented into a few hundred uh, pieces. And this has happened quite commonly throughout the history of the, of the space age. Um, uh, we're, we're up to sort of roughly 500 odd fragmentations now, uh, depending on the source that you quote. Um, and these can be caused by electrical failures, uh, reservoirs of stored energy that have just been thermally stressed because of the harsh conditions of space. Um, they can all cause these fragmentations and, and contribute to the overlying debris population. So explosions are another thing to, to keep track of. And then, as I was saying at the start, we've also had anti-satellite tests. So throughout the 60s and the 70s, so during the, the major years of the space race, um, and even into the 80s, uh, the US and the Soviet Union regularly tested their anti-satellite weaponry uh, capabilities. And uh, tens of tests were carried out in these, in these uh, decades, um, each of which contributed another few hundred fragments um, at a given time. And uh, then, we got to a stage where basically everybody thought this is probably not a very good thing to do, uh, littering space with, with all of these pieces of debris. Um, so there was an international hiatus on ASAT testing, uh, but as we'll see later on, that didn't last for very long. Moving forward to 1969, I'm sure a date familiar with most, um, but I want to use this date to highlight that we don't just leave footprints on the places we visit, um, space is another place we visit and we leave a footprint there equally. Um, so as Buzz and, and Neil left footprints um, and also uh, other bits of, of uh, equipment lying behind like the descent module um, and also uh, human waste as well. That was, that was another thing that was abandoned on the moon. Um, we also leave uh, bits of rubbish behind in, in space as well. So when a, an object launches, it might have things like payload shrouds that have to be removed, lens covers for, for scientific missions, uh, all these nuts and bolts that might uh, serve a purpose for the actual mission um, depo deposition, uh, but thereafter will just be abandoned to float around in space. Again, we've got very much better at this in recent years, but um, throughout the history, there have been a number of occasions where um, quite a lot has been abandoned uh, as a result of payload launches. So moving to this graph here, the main, the main line to consider is the white one at the top. That's just the total number of objects we're tracking. Um, and then the different colors split that into different types of objects like the payloads themselves, fragmentation debris and so on. And so we can see in the early parts of the space age leading up till now, we've just got a steady rise essentially in the number of objects we're tracking with our ground-based telescopes and radars um, on Earth. And every so often you get a spike in the number of objects when we have one of these explosions or anti-satellite tests uh, going on. Now, moving forward to 1986, this was a very sad year um, where the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster was broadcasted. Um, and because of this very public disaster, uh, lots of the major space agencies undertook a re-examination of their space safety policies. And certainly with NASA, that included the orbital debris problem. And so this was the first time that agencies were starting to think about how to tackle this issue of debris and the implications that debris might have for our scientific missions and also the services that we rely on here on Earth. And so one thing that we have to consider as well as a need for guidelines, historically, it's been the case that uh, while we may have guidelines, we may have um, certain rules of the road, there's nothing legally binding, certainly on an international scale. And so that's something that to this day, um, has contributed quite strongly to the debris problem. So moving forward, um, we still see this steady rise over time, uh, but there's an interesting feature here. Um, and so this came about because of two things, actually. Uh, the first was because um, these agencies were starting to think about the problem and starting to become more efficient with their launches. So you can see um, there's a dip around 1989 here and the number of objects we're tracking. So that's because of all this attention that, that the debris problem was, um, was finding in itself. So lots of, lots of debris was returning to the Earth's surface as it spirals in over time. Um, and we weren't adding as much, so the nets decreased as occur. Um, but this was actually accelerated um, by a higher than av average uh, solar maximum at the time, um, which swells the atmospheric envelope 
And as a result, the amount of drag that a given altitude will experience on its debris population uh, increases. And so this spiraling inwards uh, towards re-entry does actually accelerate because of that. So higher than average solar activity led to even more debris uh, being removed from the near Earth environment. However, as you can see, it didn't take long for that uh, growth to resume um, as uh, we started to launch more and more. And of course, the uh, solar activity started to, to decrease. So moving forward to 1997, um, this is quite a nice story that I like to tell. It's for when, when this, uh, what we call the Interagency uh, Orbital Debris Committee um, formed, the IADC. And this was just a collection of the major space agencies and a few other institutions uh, that came together to share their ideas, share their experiences, um, and essentially just get an idea of how we could tackle the problem on a global scale. And one of the, the key things that was solved by this communication and collaboration um, was that we had a very mysterious population of debris that we didn't really know um, much about for, for many, many years. Uh, radars on Earth had picked up this population of roughly 80,000 uh, spherical pellets, and they were um, situated in the Leo region. And we didn't really know where it come from um, until this collaboration started to, to take place. Um, we then found out that uh, in the 70s and the 80s, Russia uh, used to use what we call uh, raw sats, but they're reconnaissance units, um, and they were nuclear powered. Uh, and so at the end of their lifetimes, uh, what the Russians would do um, was to uh, raise the orbit so that they were further out the way of the active satellites that we rely on into what we call so-called graveyard orbits. And in that process, they would uh, release the nuclear reactors that were powering these, these objects. Um, and during that release, they would uh, leak quite a lot of the sodium potassium coolant that was uh, used within those systems. Um, and as a result, this coolant would rapidly solidify into these spherical pellets. So that's quite a nice example of how collaboration led to us solving what was otherwise a quite a mysterious issue in the debris problem. So 2007, moving into more recent uh, times, I said that ASAT testing wouldn't hide from us uh, for very long. And it took until the early 2000s for China to start putting its uh, anti-satellite uh, testing into play. And finally, in 2007, they were, uh, quote unquote, successful at destroying one of their satellites. Um, it was a weather satellite called Fengyun 1C. Um, it generated thousands of bits of debris. This was the single biggest event in terms of debris generation so far. Um, and one of the key things I want to point out is where it happened. It was quite high altitude within the Leo, Leo region, 850 kilometers. Um, and that's quite a dense area in, in general. That's where quite a lot of our useful satellites reside. Uh, what we call sun synchronous satellites are based there. And they're very good for Earth observation, communication, um, and also navigation and so on. So it's very popular region. And so this, this event was very uh, troublesome. It's led to uh, a huge number of what we call conjunction or collision avoidance maneuvers since, uh, where active satellites have had to move out the way to avoid colliding with pieces of these debris. So we see a huge step change in our graph here when Fengyang 1C was, was uh, destroyed. Um, and we start to see the, the catalog really swelling um, with thousands of objects now that we're tracking um, around these times. Moving forward to the next year, uh, this saw another anti-satellite test, this time by the US, interestingly. Um, but if we were to entitle this with something, it would be how to do it properly, um, would be how I'd describe it. And this uh, anti-satellite test came about because on launch, the, um, the launch failed, essentially. It failed to deposit its payload, and the payload um, was classed as a failure. Um, it was slowly spiraling back towards the Earth because we had no control over it. Um, and so in order to prevent some of the toxic hydrazine fuel that was known to be left on board, uh, reaching the ground and causing some sort of biohazard uh, disaster, um, the US decided the best solution was to destroy the satellite. Um, it was very low altitude, sort of 200 kilometers up. Um, and so most of the debris uh, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere very quickly. Um, and so it had very limited impact on the environment. 
And so moving forward to 2009, this is uh, one of the final uh, main causes of debris generation that I want to point out, and that's collisions. And this was the date of the first accidental collision between two intact satellites. Um, you've got Iridium-33, uh, which was an active satellite, and Cosmos-2251, which was an inactive former Soviet satellite. And just because of essentially a lack of communication and uh, somewhat negligence on the, on the operator's part, um, they didn't realize they were on a collision course. And uh, we ended up with a fragmentation event of roughly 2,000 trackable fragments. Um, with all of these different explosions and collisions, um, when I say fragments, that's what we actually are able to track. There are, there'll be hundreds of thousands more um, that are just too small for our telescopes and radar to pick up on Earth. Um, and so that's another problem in itself. And this was a, a lovely image um, contributed by your chair, Eric. Um, of Iridium 33. So I thought I'd show that here because it, it does show some of um, the sorts of data sets that uh, we work with at Warwick and that I'll be discussing later on in the talk. So thanks very much for that, Eric. Um, and then um, here we are with our graph again. This is bringing us mainly up to date. Um, so just before 2020. Um, and you can see that we're still uh, climbing. And I can say that things are spiking again um, as we move towards these large LEO uh, constellations that are being launched that many of you will have heard about in the news. And just to round off our, our brief history, uh, bringing things right up to date, we still see quite a lot of near misses. So although we're getting better at observing uh, these events and predicting them, um, there's sometimes nothing we can do. They're, they're involving two uncontrolled objects. And all we can do is go, well, this is roughly the uncertainty ellipsoid in position that we're looking at for both objects. Um, and we, we predict that there's a certain chance that they'll, they'll collide. And some of these are really concerning. If, if, um, if some of them uh, do actually collide, they pass within sort of meters of one another, um, then we could actually be looking at uh, what's termed the Kessler syndrome in certain uh, orbital regions. This is where we end up with collisions that seed debris events that then seed further collisions. And you end up with this runaway process that ultimately leads um, to um, you know, debris clouds just littering orbital regions and rendering them useless moving forward. And so these events are, are really concerning and we do have to get much better at predicting them and dealing with them when they happen. So as we've seen, there's a growing problem. We end up with this cloud of debris around the Earth. You can see in the Leo region, tightly compact around the Earth, we see quite a lot of objects um, building up over time there. And later on in the later years, you start to, as we fan out, see this uh, geosynchronous ring much further out as well. So that nicely shows the two types of orbits that I'll be discussing here. And just some numbers to, to put things into perspective. Um, these are changing all the time. So you take these with a pinch of salt, really. They're just the latest figures that I, I got um, when I put these slides together. Um, we're over 10,000 satellites launched now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and of those satellites, we still have roughly 6,000 in orbit. The others have deorbited and, and returned to the Earth's surface. Um, in terms of active satellites, we're closer to about 4,000. So we have quite a lot of dead satellites up there doing very little um, in terms of use. And finally, um, in terms of what we're tracking, we're roughly 28 to 30,000 objects. Um, and so that's bits of debris fragments uh, that have come about because of these explosions, collisions. It's the satellites themselves, it's rocket bodies that have been abandoned. Um, and so all of those add up to roughly that number in terms of what we can track. The most concerning number that I wanted to point out is the objects greater than a centimeter in size. Now, a centimeter is classed as what we class as dangerous in the LEO region. Because these things are moving so quickly relative to one another, we're talking relative velocities of the order of 15 kilometers per second um, in this region. So any, any, any small bit of debris can still be incredibly bullet-like and damaging. So when we look at things that are above one centimeter, which is smaller than what we can actually track at the moment, um, then we're, we're closer to sort of the million mark in terms of the number that we have orbiting around us. So that just highlights just how big this problem is and how, how far we have to go to actually solve it. And um, to put it um, 
uh, even more concerningly, there's, there's discrepancies between the models that we use to estimate these numbers. So because we can't track these objects, there's very little we can do in terms of having a set figure um, in our minds for these very small objects. And so we have to use models of the debris environment to work out what we expect to be out there. And the most common models that we use are those by NASA and ESA. Um, and the two of those disagree by a factor of two still. Um, so it just shows that even with the state of the art uh, data that we have available, um, you still get discrepancies in these models going forward. That said, we do have quite a lot of data on our hands. Um, we have the US Space Surveillance Network is uh, widely regarded as the most global network of, of surveillance, um, and certainly as the one that most people will use if they're trying to access a publicly available catalog of all these objects. Um, and that com comprises a, a, a range of optical telescopes, radar um, here on Earth. Uh, one of the most recent to commission and come online is the US Space Fence, which just acts in, in what we call um, beam park mode, where you just uh, send out a, a fence of radiation and you, you register anything that's flying through it, um, which is very useful for the low Earth orbit region. Um, and so all of these uh, things together, uh, there's a huge amount of data, but like I said, they have their limitations. They're quite archaic pieces of equipment, uh, mostly. Um, and as a result, we tend to have quite high size limits um, to these catalogs. In the Leo region, we can only track down to roughly 10 centimeters in size, and that's just not good enough, uh, whichever way you cut it. Um, and then when it comes to the smaller objects orbiting, there are still things we can do to get a statistical sense of what's out there. We're just very bad at actually knowing the full picture. Um, so some of the things we can do are look at uh, bits of spacecraft that have come back down to Earth. So this is an example um, at the top of an MLI blanket that came back uh, from one of the shuttle missions. And you can see a crater there that was caused by an impact event. Um, we've also got uh, just below that images of a, an experiment that went on in the laboratory here on Earth um, of an impact event. They, they put together a satellite model um, and fired a bullet at hypervelocity speeds into that model um, to see what would happen and, and characterize the bits of debris thereafter. And we've also got onboard cameras on some uh, spacecraft. So this is Sentinel-1A down in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, you can see that uh, there's a before and after picture here. Um, of an impact event that was taken by an onboard camera uh, that was purely installed just to look at the unfailing um, as the payload was deposited originally. Um, but fortuitously, it was still working when this event happened. Um, and you can see there's a massive chunk taken out of one of the solar panels. Um, and from that picture, we can tell things like the, the likely size of the impactor and also uh, explain why the spacecraft suffered a partial power loss, which is also useful to know. So in terms of the new challenges that we have ahead, We've got things like the constellations that are launching. There's just so many different satellites to keep track of now. Small satellites are becoming more com common. And we're even uh, venturing into the cis lunar space. So we're, we're going even further beyond uh, what was previously the outskirts of, of um, the near Earth environment uh, from an operational perspective. We're going even further out to the moon um, now that NASA's Artemis program is underway uh, and we'll expect to see traffic um, in those regions as well. So this is going to cause for new sensor architectures, um, and it's certainly something that we need to keep track of uh, going forward. In terms of the policy side of things, we also have norms of behavior to keep track of, um, and that's important uh, from the perspective of making sure that operators are, are abiding by the guidelines and not doing anything silly from a debris generating perspective. And yes, when I say silly, I do mean things like anti-satellite tests. You'd think that um, in this day and age, we would uh, know that that's probably not a good thing to do in an already crowded environment of debris, um, but alas, it still, still takes place. So moving forward to some of the proposed solutions, I'll, I'll quickly go through these because I know um, we're, we're limited by time. Um, so one of the uh, things that we use here on Earth um, for the environment, reduce, reuse, recycle, that applies to space as well. So we're starting to see a lot more of these what we call in-orbit servicing missions taking place. Um, this is an example here of Intel Sat 901. 
Um, this was a satellite that was recently docked um, by a, um, a client servicer called uh, Mission Extension Vehicle One. Uh, it's a, a mission run by Norfolk Grumman. Um, and there have been observational involvements uh, here in the UK as well, um, looking at the event as it happened, um, making sure that we've got lots of data to analyze and characterize about these uh, types of events. And what these um, sort of service, service craft do is they, they get onto the same or similar orbits as the um, target craft itself, uh, and then they approach it slowly over time. Um, and when they get so close that we can no longer resolve the two craft here on Earth, because that's obviously a, a limiting factor, um, they start to use onboard visual navigation. Um, and that's where this picture comes from here. You can see the Earth in the background, um, and this satellite is in the, the geosynchronous region. So we're roughly 36,000 kilometers up here. Um, and this craft then uh, conducts a very uh, close proximity docking maneuver. Um, and what the idea is when it's docked, it can improve the fuel reservoir, um, it can carry out any repairs with robotic arms and so on, and essentially just look to extend the life of the mission. We're adopting more sustainable practices. So this um, involves things like passivation, so releasing any sources of, of stored energy before you abandon your craft at the end of its mission. Um, so that's important to avoid these explosions that are taking place. Um, we also look at docking plates like what we've just uh, experienced uh, with MEV1 and MEV2 that have taken place recently. Uh, identifiers, so if we're looking out from Earth with our optical telescopes and various other pieces of equipment, we want certain barcodes so we can know oh, that's the that's the object we're looking at, we can tick that off and we've, we've got custody of it. And also introducing things like a space sustainability rating. So this will act very similar to what you would have as like an Uber rating. Um, it's designed to encourage operators um, to adhere to standard practices um, and not to misbehave essentially. So um, the hope is that it will improve the mitigation guideline adherence. And finally, uh, we also want to remove pieces of debris. It's not just enough to um, extend lifetimes and limit the launch rate, because of course we've got all these constellations launching and that's just not gonna be feasible. So one thing we need to do is to start removing some of the larger pieces of debris that have the highest potential of contributing even more fragments to the environment. Um, there are various ideas for this. Uh, nets have been tested in the removed debris experiment that also tested a harpoon, as you can see, um, going on here on the slide. There's also laser ideas where you fire pulses of lasers to small pieces of debris um, and the momentum that's imparted by firing those pulses starts to accelerate the, the spiraling inwards over time that takes place and eventually lead to accelerated re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. And so those are all ideas for actually removing debris, um, but they're, they're kind of in their infancy at the moment and still quite a long way off becoming mass produced enough to actually make an effect. So moving on to the last part of my talk, which I'll, I'll blitz through, um, who are we and what do we do? So I'm, I'm at the Warwick Astronomy and Astrophysics Group, um, and we've recently set up um, a center for space domain awareness. So that, that kind of focuses on this space debris problem, um, satellites in general, and just generally having a good awareness of our near Earth environment. Um, we have lots of um, facilities based on La Palma, as you can see. Um, it, that's La Palma in the picture here. We've also got some facilities in Chile at Paranel. Um, and so these are all um, facilities that we can draw from. And we've also used quite a lot of them for this area, this uh, space domain awareness area. Um, just to give you an idea of what recent La Palma has looked like, this is a picture taken by Christoph in our group. Um, it shows our domes, but also the volcan volcanic eruption that's been ongoing uh, for the past few months. It's very recently um, been classed as, as uh, ended now, um, but that's caused a lot of havoc from an ob observational perspective, as I'm sure you can imagine. So moving forward to identify some of the instruments we've got, we've got GOTI, which is a, a gravitational wave follow-up instrument. This looks for the sort of flashes of light that uh, go in tandem with the um, events that are sparked by LIGO um, and facilities like that, that, that have these big sort of uh, collisions going on in the cosmos. Um, and so that's very useful for wide field surveying. 
Um, and it's a good opportunity to highlight the issues of these large constellations for astronomers, uh, both amateur and, and in the professional community as well. And I think wide field, uh, you start to see quite a lot of these satellite trails uh, contaminating your image and they can be incredibly bright um, and render some data uh, useless without um, a huge amount of data analysis and processing. Um, these are the instruments that I'll be talking about now. So we've got um, SuperWASP, which is a former exoplanet survey, um, a RASA, which is a, a Roackerman Schmidt astrograph that we've been using, and also the Isaac Newton telescope in the background there. So just to quickly mention why we've used SuperWASP, um, this is a, a wide field uh, instrument that previously was looking um, at finding uh, what we call hot Jupiters, so these uh, large Jupiter-sized planets uh, that are orbiting very close to their parent stars. And the way it does that is using the transit method, um, which uh, statistically um, is very unlikely to catch um, a, a system in the, in the right orientation to be able to find a, a decent enough signal um, of, of the dip that happens as the, as the planet moves in front of its host star, um, because you've got to imagine that these uh, things can be orbiting at all, all different inclinations. And so the likelihood of finding it um, in the right orientation is quite low. And so as a result, you rely on these wide field instruments to be able to observe uh, enough stars that statistically you get um, a, a good enough sample. And so this got us thinking, we, we quite like the idea of a wide field, this can be useful for us. And so to, to give you an idea of just how wide the field is, these are the sorts of fields of view that we're quite used to um, in our lines of work. Um, we've got the Liverpool telescope, which is about four arc minutes. Uh, the Isaac Newton telescope about um, the same size or same, same footprint of the moon on the sky. Um, and even our uh, wide field astrograph is only a few degrees by a few degrees. Um, if we compare those to the SuperWASP field, we see that it's uh, much more useful from a wide field perspective. And what it allows us to do is um, be able to use quite a, an archaic mount, um, but also to observe these low Earth orbit objects, which I'm sure if some of you have uh, tried to observe uh, things like the ISS passing, um, you know just how quickly you have to be tracking um, to be able to get a decent photo. Um, and so what we're trying to um, do here is uh, remove that difficulty um, by having a wide enough field that we can let the, the, the low Earth orbit satellite trail within the image. Um, and then we end up placing apertures along this trail and uh, through further processing end up with uh, very precise light curves uh, with very high cadence. And so there's an example of our scheduling software here. We, we take into um, account the position of the moon, um, the position of the Earth shadow, um, because we obviously don't want our objects to go into eclipse, which is a, a major issue with low Earth orbit um, satellites. And so from that, we're, we're able to schedule in the objects we want to observe. And then in post-processing, um, we're able to, as I said, get these light curves out. We've done a very similar thing with our astrograph. Um, but because of the, the narrower field of view, um, we've actually been using this for the high altitude objects in the geosynchronous region because they don't move as quickly on sky. And so um, this is a picture of myself and my colleague Paul working in La Palma. Um, but you can see here we've got some light curves that we've obtained from, from these measurements. Um, and these are very high cadence and we're already starting to see that similar satellite buses lead to similar signatures in our light curves. So it's a very good um, method of characterizing what you're looking at um, by comparing the different signatures that we see in the light curves between different objects. You can see the top four panels here correspond to objects that are familiar as box wing spacecraft, um, like we'd think of uh, by default. And then the bottom four panels correspond to more cylindrical spacecraft like this one down here. And uh, very quickly, I'll move through this final project uh, that I wanted to mention, which is Debris Watch. Uh, this is my main body of work, and it used the 2.5 meter Isaac Newton telescope to do a survey of very faint debris in the high altitude ob orbits. And so um, just to give you an idea of the motivation for this sort of work, um, very recently in 2018, um, there was a uh, anomaly uh, experienced by Talcum 1 and another satellite in the geosynchronous region. You can see it's trundling along the, the point source here, and then suddenly it um, break, fragments into uh, various pictures, uh, pieces, sorry. Um, 
And as a result, this kind of motivated our survey to look at the fainter debris population because we know there's small objects out there. Um, it's just that there's very little time available on large telescopes um, and it's very difficult to observe these things with anything other than those. So this is the sort of data we were um, utilizing. We were fixed on sky, um, <clears throat> so not tracking siderially as we normally would. Um, we had the, the uh, telescope fixed so that we would match um, the tracking rates of these geosynchronous objects very slow moving on sky. And you can see we've got all these stars streaking through as a result and things that are slightly off geostationary um, we see as small trails as you can see skipping along here. Interestingly in this uh, animation you can see a large satellite skipping along but you can also see a piece of debris uh, skipping along down in the bottom half of the panel here. So that's the sort of object that we were trying to uncover with this survey. Uh, I'll skip through that. This is the population that we um, obtained from our survey. So anything that's blue here um, or cyan is things that we already knew about. So they appear in the catalogs that we have available. So it's usually the brighter objects, um, the bigger objects that we are quite used to tracking normally and therefore have been catalogued over time. The red objects are things that haven't been catalogued and roughly 75% of our um, of our surveyed population um, were uncatalogued objects. And you can see we got down to a faintness of roughly 20th visual magnitude, which corresponds to roughly 10 centimeters in size. So you've got to think we're, we're looking at something just bigger than a mobile phone, roughly 36,000 kilometers away. So we're getting to quite faint uh, levels here um, in terms of uh, probing the population of debris. And we were able to, because a lot of these objects were trailing, we were able to get these high cadence light curves out again and see some of the um, signatures that these objects were having and, and try to infer some of the characterization that we could perform purely using this data set. Um, and so a more interesting example here um, is a very faint object, roughly 18th to 19th magnitude. So this is roughly sort of your 20 to 30 centimeter level. Um, and you can see even this sort of very small object is showing wildly variable um, brightness over time, <clears throat> even in these very short um, 10 second exposures. And so what we can tell from this is this is likely a very highly reflective um, piece of debris. Uh, it's probably um, some sort of blanketing um, that as deterioration has gone on over time, um, some satellites uh, release some of their blanketing uh, due to the harsh conditions that they're orbiting within. Um, and we end up with these fragments um, that are just floating around uh, in space doing uh, very little and posing quite a high threat to the active satellites. So that brings me to the end of the different projects that we've got going on at Warwick. Uh, before I close, I just wanted to uh, advertise one of the networks that we've set up um, the purpose of this network is to bring together all different sectors. So we've got industry, academia, but also um, the amateur astronomy community as well, because there's definitely a lot that the amateur astronomy community um, can contribute to the problem. Um, and I'll be happy to discuss that in the Q&A section that follows this, um, if that's of interest. Um, but just to highlight uh, a virtual workshop that we got out, completely free to register um, and virtual. So very easily accessible. It's SSA and astronomy, um, and that will be taking place on the 21st of February. Please um, feel free to check out our website, gnosisnetwork.org, um, and that uh, has lots more information on the goals of the network. Um, even if you're just someone that wants to find out a bit more and is maybe interested in finding out more about the issue, um, and you found this talk interesting, there, there are lots of blog posts available and various things like that um, that might give you a bit more information uh, that I've missed out today. So please do check that out if you're interested. And just to bring uh, the talk to a close and summarize, um, the history of spaceflight is both a short and messy one. Um, things are set to get much worse if we don't do anything about it. Um, and there are a wide variety of challenges that need to be overcome in the, the coming decade and beyond. Um, this ranges from things like tracking ever smaller objects um, keeping track of ever-growing catalogues of objects um, and also fostering that cooperation on a global scale because we, we're still lacking those legally binding guidelines um, that are so intrinsic to, to solving the issue. So that's something that we have to tackle going forward. And finally at Warwick, we're applying a range of astronomical tools and techniques 
uh, to help with this problem, mainly in the detection, the tracking and the characterization of objects in space. So with that, I'll thank you for your time um, and I'll hand over uh, back to, to Eric for, for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Fantastic, James. Thank you very much for that. And your timing's absolutely spot on. And we've got a few questions. That's good to in. hear. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, that's good. And we've left enough time to actually probably get through a lot of these questions and comments. Going back to the, um, hi, and quite a bit back now is, uh, uh, see the Mir space station. I mean, it was up there for what, 15 years or so, I think. Um, yeah, roughly that. How did, how did it cope? How did it fare with uh, debris? Or was there so much of it up there at that time? Yeah, so I, th I think at that sort of time, um, the debris problem was becoming more of an issue in the sense that people were starting to think ahead and think, oh, in a similar uh, case to global warming, um, there were obviously the early pioneers that, that foresaw the problem, um, even though it maybe wasn't noticeable to many at the time. Um, and it was a similar sort of situation with the debris problem. So um, in, in the era of the Mir uh, spacecraft and, and uh, space station, it, it wasn't so much of a problem that they had many issues to deal with. It's much, much more prevalent these days with the ISS. Um, there, there's been cases recently, even with the ASAT test, um, the crew of seven on board the ISS had to um, get into the evacuation um, uh, sort of procedures uh, to, to avoid um, pieces of debris that just weren't catalogued yet. So they had to make sure that they had a, an escape plan just in case things turned hairy, essentially, in case the surveillance networks worked out that the ISS was on a collision course. Um, so it's much more prevalent these days now that we've got so much out there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, certainly over time, if it had um, lasted much longer, there probably would have been issues, but not that I know of, I don't think. Yeah, that's actually interesting because you brought up there, you know, that the ISS it has a, a sort of safe room, <laughs> so to speak, for the, for the crew. Um, what, but there must be, there's obviously critical equipment up there now. I mean, lots of it. How how do, how how is that protected? Yeah, so I, I mean, not just with the the ISS. There's obviously satellites that we rely on for a whole host of um, services here on Earth. Um, think things like uh, you know communications and navigation. They're so intrinsically part of modern life that any sort of disruption is is classed as a disaster these days. And, and you know, th this is the sort of thing that can bring, a, bring an end and, um, you know, cause mission fatal damage to these satellites that we rely on. So there's, there's plenty that can go wrong. Fortunately, very little has so far on that sort of scale. Um, but as we move into sort of this, this decade and beyond, um, these near misses are becoming more and more common. And it's only a matter of time, really, if nothing's done, that, that we'll start to, to see more and more of the active satellites that we're, we actually um, care about, so to speak, uh, getting involved in these near misses that, that can sometimes be of the order of 10 metres or so. Um, and you think, you know, these things passing so close at, at such huge uh, relative velocities, you can see just how damaging these events can be and, and widespread. Yeah, I mean, it's there are some notorious uh, events uh, where the ISS space crew or the walkers they've lost equipment when they've been doing their work, haven't they? Yeah, exactly. There, there are stories of you know uh, people losing um, you know spanners, nuts and bolts, and things that they're working with. I, I think there's even a camera floating around um, that, that that was dropped. Um, and and yeah, all of these different pieces of of equipment they all amount to this overriding uh, debris population that you know most of which is too small still to to be able to to regularly track and and reliably keep track of um yeah. it's see the um right see the military or governmental type space projects that mm, i'm sure a lot of people don't get informed about how do you how do you monitor the secret or the stealth type um equipment hardware and debris how, how do you find out about it so it's it's a it's a very challenging one, and, and there are obviously levels to to that sort of classification. So some some might just not appear in the publicly available catalogue, but if you're um, you know working professionally in a in a governmental role, you might have access to it in a more sort of um, bolstered catalogue that's available to you. Um, and so that does happen quite often. And indeed, with some of our research, we've had cases. Um, 
in fact, you may have noticed with our with our population that we uh, uncovered with the survey with the IMT, um, there were some very bright objects that weren't catalogued, and that's purely for that very reason, is that we we weren't able to to find them in the publicly available catalogue, so therefore we couldn't we couldn't correlate them with anything. It's of course tracked, but. Um, it, it's just a case of, you know, somewhere along the line, someone said we don't want that publicly available and we want that to remain hidden. Um, so that, that does happen quite often. And for our line of work, because we're, we're mainly interested in the research, not necessarily the, the operational um, side of things, that doesn't really affect us too much. But you can imagine if you're an operator trying to keep your satellite safe and you've got this unknown object that's got very mysterious properties and behaviours going on, then you, you want to keep track of that and, and know what it is um so there, there are lots of things like that that are quite difficult to deal with on an operational level yeah i wonder if you can use the data to back calculate where you see the debris and then you can work out where the thing originally there, was. there are some some very interesting stories of i, I think there was a, an infamous one where um donald trump uh tweeted a a sort of satellite image of a of an enemy base um in the middle east, middle east uh, and someone was able to use the timings to, to track back to where the satellite must have been that took the image. Um, and there, there's, you know, all, all sorts of stories, like there's actually probably close to 20 Hubble Space Telescopes in, in, in space right now, only looking into the Earth rather than out from the Earth because they're, they're used for surveillance more than uh, scientific purposes, sadly. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way. Yes, you're talking about, you know, the risk to sort of um, satellites or hardware in space. Is re-entering debris a, a risk to people, a, a property on the surface of the Earth? Yeah, so there, there's a lot of push towards uh, what, what's called design for demise. I think I had it in one of the slides, but I forgot to mention it at the time. Um, so design for demise is basically designing your equipment on board a spacecraft to be able to burn up in the atmospheric re-entry phase. So that removes the, the risk to uh, ground-based civilization essentially um, there, there is a, a, a mathematical formula that people use to assess the risk that um, spacecraft pose to humans on earth um, and you know there's a there's a formula for everything I guess but I, I find it quite morbid that they're going oh that's above a certain threshold so so that's mm -hmm. fine um, but you do get stories of, of you know fuel propellant fuel tanks that are just too too substantial essentially to burn up reaching uh, quite usually quite um, you know places in the middle of nowhere really um, just because of the the sort of orbital lines as they as they re-enter the earth's atmosphere um, there's also the, the the graveyard as we call it in the pacific ocean where uh, most things tend to um, if they're done in a controlled fashion they tend to be re-entered there um, so there's, there's, there's lots of things going on to try and improve that that risk um, but there is still a a, a a finite risk shall we say um of your house being hit by a piece of space junk which is always interesting to, to consider from a philosophical perspective <laughs> well expanding on that design for demise uh, what's what are the plans for the safe decommissioning of the iss because that will happen sometime i would think well yes yeah, so that that's that's something that um i'm i'm not hugely privy to um but certainly in the in the coming years i'm sure that will become um a bigger a bigger issue that people have to um to deal with there's of course the lunar gateway that's planned as well which will be a, a similar sort of modular station um but in the the cis lunar um orbits um and so the, these kind of uh deorbiting um sort of events they, they can be quite exciting actually because there's very little is known about the atmospheric properties um, such, such as things like drag um, it's very difficult to predict the behavior that, that a, a given spacecraft will have when it's re-entering um, and so that's actually something that uh, I wanted to mention is quite useful from the amateur astronomy community you do tend to find a lot of cases where things have re-entered by surprise uh, turning out in images that were taken by someone in their back garden um, just because chance wise that's that's the most likely thing to occur um, they, these things are so random sometimes that um, it's it's the most likely um, way of uh, obtaining data on that sort of event hmm. I've got a, an interesting question here that's on the of the several businesses that are working on the debris removal uh, in, in space are any of them close to a point of actually being able to do it you know 
commercially or successfully on a reasonable scale? Yeah, so there, there's a couple that have, um, I guess, pioneered the way. Um, and uh, one of those is, is AstroScale, um, which some of you may have heard of in the news. Um, there's a, a mission that's been launched recently called Alsa D. Um, and this is going to be the first mission to test capturing a, a lost piece of debris, essentially. So they plant the debris um, and then, you know, uh, adjust the orbit to lose the piece of debris and then basically use tracking facilities to pick it up again and dock with it and, and uh, reel it back in, essentially. Um, they're also the first to test docking with a tumbling piece of debris because that's quite common um, and is something that will be key to future missions. Um, but as I said, mo most of these things are still in their kind of testing phase. Um, I imagine if, if any company is uh, close to doing so on a commercial, commercially viable scale, it's Astro scale. Um, but um, there are also other institutions and agencies that have missions planned that are aiming to kind of accelerate that process as well plugging a lot an awful lot of money into it um in the area so that's that's good news cool thank you please do know there's only two questions left I've no got... no it's good i, I, I do like a <laughs> q a session <laughs> but this one's uh um you know you, you're talking about you know your, your the orbit just just around the air so to speak <laughs> how does this sort of monitoring and tracking and modeling compared to the tracking of near earth objects yeah, so it's actually very similar and a lot of the um, tools and techniques that are used in the, the near Earth object um, community, uh, they, they do transfer pretty much directly across to this sort of problem. The only thing you're dealing with are different tracking rates, essentially. So um, whereas quite a lot of, um, shall we say, like asteroid observations, they, they might actually be um, quite slow moving on sky. Uh, a lot of these things are, are very rapid as, as again, any, any of you that have tried to observe, say the ISS, for example, will be aware these, these sorts of passes from horizon to horizon can be incredibly quick. Um, and so that, that sort of tracking issue is one of the reasons why we struggle to get down to the sort of, um, you know, limiting magnitudes that are required to uncover the smaller pieces of debris. Um, so there's certainly a lot of uh, techniques that can be transferred across um, it's just very uh, difficult to, to um, do so in a, a sort of useful way from that small debris perspective. Cool, right. And the final one is, how hopeful are you that all this, all this work, you know, your type, your work, your agency, you're talking to other agencies, other countries, how hopeful are you that this will lead to international cooperation in the future, diffuse international tensions, and especially with nations that are aiming to join the space community, you know, testing their rockets and hardware. How, how hopeful are you that? Yes, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so in terms of where we're at currently, um, it's it's progressing. Um, there, there are uh, things like uh, the United Nations, they have a, a particular uh, group um, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, quite a mouthful, but um, that, that's basically been meeting on an international scale and coming up with these standard guidelines. Um, the issue is they're still guidelines, they're not, they're not regulations. Um, and so that, ne that next step of making them regulated um, is, is kind of the, the, the barrier, if you like. Um, and the only the issues there are like with any international law, there's so many different pitfalls and loopholes and so on that that can be exploited by nefarious, um, you know, operators and so on. Uh, that it's really difficult to actually establish the guidelines and the regulations in the first place. Um, so in order to kind of improve the situation, I think things like this space sustainability rating uh, that I mentioned are going to be much more. Um, wide reaching because in the meantime that will kind of put the onus on operators to not give shoddy service if you like it this is the same idea with like I said Uber um, you're, you're not going to utilize uh, someone's services if they've got a, a two three star rating compared to a five star one so um, that that will hopefully incentivize enough to be able to improve uh, matters um, but as for emerging nations that you mentioned at the end of the question, um, that's another issue in itself. It's kind of where, where does the liability come from? Um, you know, we, we've had uh, the US, the Soviet Union and Russia um, have had decades and decades to, to fine tune their sustainability practices and so on. 
uh, how do we treat the, the nations that are only fledgling uh, nations within the space domain? Um, how do we treat them fairly so that they can learn by trial and error as well, while still acting sensibly and sustainably? Do we, do we make sure that we pass on our teachings? Do we, do we make sure they've got enough freedom to learn themselves and so on? So it's all very complex an issue to, to solve and uh, still ongoing. So I, I, I do think it's probably going to take another decade or so to, to iron all of those issues out on, a, on an international scale, at least. Cool. Well, James, can I just take this opportunity to thank you for a really interesting, thought-provoking and a, a relevant thank talk you, for, for us amateur astronomers. <laughs> it's very clear that us humans, we really are messy litter out. We don't appear to be able to travel anywhere without leaving some unsightly blot on the landscape or the spacescape. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, at some time, hopefully in the near future, James, speakers will be physically receiving a token of our appreciation and a thank you card that is designed and printed by Pauline. You will get one. Uh, just We'll just need to send it to you the old-fashioned postal way. That's thank you very much. That's if they're not uh, isolating. <laughs> um, James, again, just thank you very much once again. And I hope you can stay with us for a while and experience uh, the rest of our club meeting. You're, you're in for a treat, as we talked about just before, just before the meeting. Definitely. I've heard good things. Thank you, Eric. Well, thank you very much. And now I'm going to the club news, the Astro Picks and the targets for the month. Pauline is recharged and all excited for the new year ahead. <laughs> and she's with us again to show you what the club has been getting up to. She's got some stunning photographs taken by us enthusiastic amateurs. And she's also going to start off with what to look for in the winter sky. Pauline, over to you. Thank you very much, Eric. Well, happy new year, everyone. And the first uh, constellation of 2022 is going to be Canis Major or the big dog. Now Canis Major is one of Orion's two hunting dogs, the other one being Canis Minor. And Canis Minor is a tiny constellation, consists of just two stars, the bright procyon and a fainter star here. Canis Major itself is often depicted as standing on its hind legs chasing Lepus the hare. Now, Canis Major has got a few nice bright stars within it, which helps to make it relatively easy to find in the sky. But as usual, the way the dots are joined varies according to whether you, or according to which books you look at or which internet sites you look at. And I come across this drawing quite a lot where the dog has a tummy, but also a triangular head and look at where Sirius is here. So basically this is in the wrong place and I'll show you why in a moment. But the stars making up the triangular head, well, they are very difficult to see because they're very faint. So quite honestly, the best way of learning a constellation is to keep it as simple as possible. And this is the best way to do that. So just a few lines between the brightest of the stars. And this is the reason why I said Sirius was in the wrong place. Because it's often described as the dog with a blazing face because it appears to hold Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, in its jaws. So both dogs are part of the winter triangle. And of course, we've got Sirius in Canis Major. We have Procyon in Canis Minor, and both these are bright stars and they are relatively nearby. The third star in the triangle is Betelgeuse in Orion. Again, it's a bright star. And it's a red supergiant, which is why it appears as bright as it does at this distance away from us. Now, Canis Major is relatively easy to find once you've located Sirius. And Sirius should be shining brightly down and to the left 
of Orion. But when the constellations are rising, you should really check that you're not actually looking at Procyon. The way to do that is to use Orion's belt, which will point directly to Sirius. So now you've got Sirius, you can find the rest of the brighter stars. The main problem, however, is the elevation of Canis Major. It's really quite low down, just above the southern horizon, and very easily blocked by trees or houses. You need to wait until it has risen as high as possible in the night sky. And in January, that tends to be between nine and 10 o'clock, but it will get earlier as the month goes on and as you get into February. Now, Sirius is known as the dog star, and I'll explain why in a moment. So of course it's, it's here and it's a very bright star. Yeah, brightest in the night sky. It's a white main sequence star. And this is a hotter star than our sun. It has twice the mass and about 25 times the luminosity. Hence the reason why it's bright. And of course, the fact that it's not that far away is also why it's quite bright. It also has a faint white dwarf companion. Now this white dwarf companion is, orbits Sirius in about um, 50 years. And apparently, from what I've read, it, has, it is at its furthest point from Sirius at the moment. And it should be visible in eight inch telescopes and above. So may not be so easy to locate in a telescope, but put on a camera and there is a challenge to all those astrophotographers out there. Now Sirius actually means scorching, glowing or searing. It rises just before sunrise and this is the important time. So it's before sunrise during the hottest part of the summer the so-called dog days, hence the, the name dog star. The Greeks and Romans thought it was responsible for the heat, but it also very importantly marked the flooding of the Nile in Egypt. So when the Egyptians knew that it was, that the flooding was imminent by the rising of Sirius, they knew when it was going to be time to plant their crops. I'll just talk about a few of the bright stars in Sirius because some of them are quite interesting. This one, for instance, Mirza, it means the announcer. And that's probably because it rose just before Sirius. Now it doesn't look like it in this diagram, but as these constellations rise, they are tipped over slightly onto their side. So Mirza would certainly rise before Sirius. But more than that, if you go further south, particularly to Egypt, then you will find that the constellations are tipped over quite a bit more. So Mozam would be up here somewhere as it rose before Sirius did. It's a big bright star. It's a blue white giant and 500 light years away. And yet it's really quite bright. And then we have Weizen, which means the weight. I have no idea why. And this is a white supergiant. So again, it's bright, magnitude 1.8, and it's 1800 light years away. So it's incredibly big and bright. Adhara is a blue giant. So we're looking at all these really bright, massive stars at the moment. It's the second brightest star in the constellation at magnitude 1.5. And again, it's a long way away. But interestingly, 47 million years ago, it was actually the brightest star in the sky at minus four. Now that is almost as bright as Venus. And at the time, it was only 34 light years away. So it's moved quite a distance in the 47 million years since it was the brightest star in the sky. And lastly, 
we have another blue supergiant. Again, very bright, but my goodness me, look at how far away it is. That gives you some idea as to how massive and large this star is. So the constellation itself is made up of really quite nice brightish stars. There are a few things that you can see with binoculars. M41 is a nice binocular object. It's large and it's bright, and it also contains a number of orange giant stars, which are easily visible in binoculars. However, I will just say that you want to be in a relatively dark sky, away from light pollution. I've tried looking out of my study window here because I've got houses in the way, so I have to be up high. And I've used binoculars and I cannot see M41. But as soon as I put my small 80 millimeter refractor on it, I've got a beautiful view. So you need a relatively dark sky. It doesn't help having the moon in the sky and Christmas lights and everything else because it's got an overall magnitude of 4.5. So in theory, it should be possible to see from a dark sky site with the naked eye using averted vision and that'll give you a better view of it. In a small telescope, you should be able to see around 100 stars. And they say they, that these stars form bunches and curves. Well, I'm afraid I didn't see anything like that in my small refractor. Now NGC 2362 is another open star cluster, just a binocular object. But look, it's got this lovely star in the middle. And this lovely star is a blue supergiant. It's magnitude 4.4. So you know you're in the right place if you can see that through your binoculars. The rest of the cluster may appear really quite fuzzy, but you'll know that it's there. Using a small telescope, you should see around 60 stars. Now, when you've got a blue supergiant star, you know you've got a young star cluster. This one is only 5 million years old because it doesn't take long before these explode as supernova. This cluster, on the other hand, is a very old one. It's two billion years old, so it's got no um, blue supergiants within it. Again, it's an open star cluster. This one is known as Caroline's cluster, and Caroline was the sister of William Herschel, who discovered Uranus. And she described this as a very pretty cluster. So again, in theory, you should be able to see it in binoculars, most likely rather a hazy patch, dark sky sight, better. If you use a medium telescope, you should be able to see around 45 stars. It's a long way away. And although we've got quite a few blue stars in the image here, a number of these are actually foreground stars and not within the cluster itself. Now, this is a lovely image. And you see 2359 is Thor's helmet. It's a nebula. And it's really a telescope and astrophotography object because it has a magnitude of only 11.45. And this is an enormous bubble of gas blown by the very powerful winds of a Wolf Rayet star right in the center here. And Wolf Rayet stars are huge, extremely hot, and have this very energetic solar wind. And because the star is within a large nebula here, as it's blowing um, all its, its it, the, the gas away from itself, it's encountering denser areas of the nebula. And therefore you end up with these weird and complex, but rather beautiful shape. And you can see why it's called Thor's helmet. And then we have another telescope astrophotography object. Um, this one might be quite difficult to image. It, this is of course the, by Hubble once again. These are two spiral galaxies in the process of colliding. It's rather, they make a rather beautiful photograph. And you can see how the smaller galaxy is losing this material as it's being drawn into the greater gravitational pull of the larger galaxy. So on to sky stuff. We've had the new moon 
And the full moon is on the 17th, 18th of January. And I reckon that's when my fourth grandchild is going to be born because so many of them seem to be born around the full moon. Here is Canis Major. You see how low down it is. But this is at, in the early stage of January, it's, that's at eight o'clock, late January, this is where you would find it at seven. Therefore, as late January become, uh, comes along, wait until around eight and it'll be a good bit further over. Into February, again, you'll find that Canis Major will have reached its highest point in the sky at a decent time in the evening. So that's when to look for it. Mercury at the moment is an evening object and it reached its greatest eastern elongation. That's when it's at its furthest point from the sun on the 7th of January. At the moment, it's at its highest. It was probably at its highest yesterday, but it'll remain there for the next two or three days. But now it's beginning to get a little bit fainter. So it's shining at magnitude minus 0.25, and it's just going to descend and fade away and it'll have completely disappeared by mid-month, it doesn't last long. Jupiter, I'm sure you can still see it quite easily. It's still blazing away in the night sky, but it's getting lower as it gets towards the Southwest. And Saturn, well, it's merging into the twilight now. At the moment, it's actually fainter than Mercury, but that won't last long as Mercury zooms downwards. But Saturn by, middle of the month, I think, it's just, it's going to be lost in the twilight. And then on the 4th of February, it's going to have moved behind the sun. That's superior conjunction. And then it's going to reappear in the morning sky in mid-March. So all our planets are gradually moving to the morning. Same with Venus. Now, Venus has been doing a bit of odd things this month. At the beginning of January, it was visible in the evening along with Mercury, very low down in the southwest, but it was there. And then it moved between us and the sun, which is inferior conjunction, and that was on the 9th of January. So it's now disappeared from view, but it's going to reappear in the morning. And by the end of January, it will have got, well, not very high above the horizon but it is climbing. And hopefully by this point, it'll have risen maybe a couple of hours before the sun. And it's really bright at the moment. Remember, it's very close to the sun, present shape minus magnitude 4.6. And then we've got Mars. Now it's also a morning object, but you're not going to see it unless you've got a very clear southeastern horizon. It's really low down and is only magnitude 1.4. At the moment, Mars is almost at its furthest from us, having passed behind the sun in October, that's superior conjunction. Venus, on the other hand, is almost at its closest, having just passed between us and the sun. And that's why it's so bright. Now, Mars has this two year period where we have one year where it's getting bright, really bright, and then it's dropping away, and then it gets really faint following year, and then year after that, it'll begin to get brighter again. You can use Venus to find Mars. Stretch your arm right out as far as you can and make a fist. Put Venus, because Venus you should be able to see, or at least easier when it gets a little bit higher in the sky. Put Venus on the left of your fist, and Mars should appear on the right of your fist, but down a bit. You will, remember, need a clear eastern horizon for this. Now, the biggest space news is probably the launch of this James Webb Space Telescope. So that happened at Christmas. All successful, so that was good. But what is, I find incredible is that this started 25 years ago, and it was originally due to be launched in 2007. It's a little bit late, but if it works, who cares? 
It has a 6.5 meter mirror, and that's much bigger than Hubble, which has a 2.4 meter mirror. Now they talk about the James Webb as being the successor to Hubble, but you're not going to get the same sort of photographs because it's an infrared telescope. And the wavelengths used will be right at the red end of the visible spectrum, carry on a bit longer and you'll end up in the near infrared and mid infrared. Now, near infrared penetrates dust that obscures cool objects, so you're seeing through the dust, but mid infrared can actually show dusty objects such as circumstellar disks. These are the disks around baby stars. This is what forms the baby stars. And the reason we might be able to see these is because of the large mirror. So it's going to look at light from the very first stars and galaxies. And these objects are very old and they are an awfully long way away. The light from them to us has been stretched over the time it has taken to travel to us, it's moved into the red end or the infrared end of the spectrum. And that's why we need an infrared telescope in order to be able to view these things. So as I said, it's going to study the formation of stars from the really earliest stages and the formation of galaxies. And that is where this big mirror comes into it because the resolution is going to be so much better than Hubble, but also those ground telescopes on Earth. It's also going to study our solar system, in particular the atmospheres of the giant planets. Um, that would be really good for Uranus and Neptune. It'll have a look at exoplanets and the origins of life. So not really that much then. Now, <laughs> the James Webb has to get past 344 hurdles to achieve its operational layout, which is just incredible. So the most, the trickiest part was probably the sun shield. It had to unfold and then it had to, all the five layers had to separate. And each layer is as thin as a human hair, which is just incredible, but it's vital. If that didn't work, then well, you know, you're at the end of the mission, basically. You have to have the sun shield to stop the heat of the sun um, warming up the telescope, because the telescope, because it's operating in infrared wavelengths, has to be really cold. So we're looking at something like minus 230 degrees centigrade. But then there are some instruments that need to be a few degrees above absolute zero. And absolute zero is minus 273 degrees centigrade. So that's why the sun shield is critical. Then we've got the unfolding of the telescope. And that was also successful. So you can see how it was packaged in order to take off in the, in the rocket. Now we've got individual mirror segment movements. They've got to make sure that each mirror can move relative to the other. And this will so it can be put in exactly the right position so it can focus properly. That will take probably about a week. And then after a month, it should reach the second Lagrange point, which is here. This means that uh, this, this is a, a gravitationally stable position so that as the Earth orbits the Sun, so will the James Webb Telescope, keeping pace with the Earth. And then after that, it's got to cool down to those really low temperatures. It's got to make sure that everything works and it's got to make sure that it can focus properly. So that's gonna take another five months or so. So let's hope it doesn't overshoot the L2 point and that everything does work as it should. So this is the sequence of everything that has taken place.
which is just incredible. I'm always astonished and amazed at what um, these engineers and astronomers are able to achieve. So just a heads up, we've got a partial lunar eclipse that's gonna take place on the 15th, 16th of May. It'll be early in the morning and it'll have, uh, it'll be fully eclipsed as it sets. And then we have another partial eclipse. It's not going to be as good as last year's, but who cares, it's an eclipse. So it's still going to be brilliant, as long as it's not cloudy, of course, which it might be given the fact it's October. Okay, just a couple of items in the club news. Now we have sold most of the calendars. We have a few left, so if there are any of you that suddenly think, oh yes, I really do want one of your calendars, then please let me know. We have made a profit for the club, which was the whole idea, and that's fantastic. I don't know exactly how much yet, um, so we'll be finding that out. And thank you to everyone who has bought one and therefore supported us. As Eric was saying, observing has been pretty rubbish. We did manage one observing session before Christmas. It was a decent sky, but washed out by the moon, but we did get some lunar observing in, which was nice. Now, since then, there's been a lot of clouds, or clear nights have been ruined by the moon. And of course, we've also had a lot of, well, it's mist, but frost, and ice. And I certainly don't like going out myself when it's icy and it's going to be worse when it's night. And I don't like the idea of anyone else going out in these conditions because they can be really quite dangerous. But hopefully we will get some decent nights, no ice. Now for the photographs. So Dave is wishing everyone a happy winter solstice. And this is the winter solstice moon taken on the 21st of December. Here we have an eerie sky by Andy Groff with the moon trying to break through, but doing so in this thinner uh, band of cloud along the sky. Where there was a bit of a panic at the end of November because of this very strange light shooting up into the sky. It wasn't just seen on um, the all sky camera, but also it was visible to people nearby. And it turned out to be um, a, a lighting event by Prism Event Lighting, who were doing this for a party. And I think it was in Bogordon. So we haven't seen it again. Let's hope it doesn't happen anymore. Got some nice Milky Way photographs by Lisa, occasionally with a hint of the Aurora. Eric has um, entitled this Witch on a Broomstick because this took place on Halloween. It's a meteor, which you can see is breaking up there. Well, I presume it's a meteor. And we've got another one down here. I mean, who knows? It could be debris coming in from these bits of satellite that's zooming around. Not sure what this is, Eric. It looks like a, a flare on the lens. But we can see a, um, an enlarged version of this meteor here. And then we've got the moon, Jupiter with the Galilean moons here, Saturn. Moon and Jupiter, and this one is by Pete of Sigma. And this is an incredible one. So this is by Katie of Stornoway Astronomical Society of the Kalanish, Kalanish stones. We've got Jupiter, moon, Saturn and Venus, but what an incredible backdrop. And a lovely photograph by Dave, Moon, Jupiter, Saturn and Venus, very clear. Uh, a slightly blurred image of my Jupiter, Saturn and Venus. And this is not the Moon. This is an image of Venus taken on Christmas Day during the day. Now you can see Venus is at a really thin crescent because it won't be long before it's going into inferior conjunction. That's where it goes between us and the sun. But to actually get an image like this, it's just incredible. And of course we have some wonderful 
moon photographs by Dave. So this was on the 10th of December. A few days later, it's turned into a gibbous moon. And the day after that, we've got a long shot of the gibbous moon in the clouds. And this is moonrise just before um, full moon. Absolutely beautiful. And it's in the mist and there was a lot, of, we've had a lot of mist around in the, around Christmas time. And there's there've been a, a few um, auroral sightings. And of course, the further north you are, the brighter, um, more colorful, they tend to be. So this is by Ian from North Ronaldsay Astronomy Group in Orkney. That was on the 3rd of November. Really bright green, but notice there's red up in that left top left-hand corner. And then Sue also managed to get beautiful image, again with a lot of red. And this one is particularly noticeable. Now down in the highlands, Cara managed to capture these three images with the green of the aurora in the distance between the clouds. And again, Eric has captured the green of the aurora, but no red. But that same night, if you look on his all sky camera, look at the red in the sky here. So they saw it in Orkney, but it wasn't visible to us at this latitude. The next day, there was another aurora, beautiful greens, but look at this one by Lisa, absolutely gorgeous. And then on the ninth, up in Orkney once again, really, really red sky. On the 1st of December, Lisa caught this green aurora. Now the red, I'm not sure whether that's partly the aurora coming through the clouds or not. But up in Orkney, Ian managed to get red and green. And again, the red, this almost bronzy colour. And then Sue Shackleton up in Orkney, really bright green, gorgeous reds above it. And then a couple of days later, more aurora. Now, here is the Christmas comet. So it, this is Comet Leonard. And Dave had managed to capture it beautifully with M3 in the background here. Half an hour later, he's got it again. And you can see how it's moved. So if we look at the first photograph, look at that star there. Now look at the star. So in half an hour, it's moved a huge distance. And this was the comet that was really racing across our skies during December. And this is a picture of the comet by Katie from Stornoway Astronomical Society. And it's just incredible. It looks like a monstrous snake. There's its jaws, or its lower jaw, with its tongue inside and its upper jaw, two little nostrils there, and then its eyes above that. This is just extraordinary, it's beautiful. Eric also managed to capture the comet. I spent hours photographing the right areas, but absolutely nothing came out on my camera, so I was really disappointed. Lovely, colorful star trails that, was, that um, Eric captured on Christmas day. And then we've got the Pleiades, always lovely to see by Dave. And of course, one of our old favorites, the Orion Nebula. But there's always a lot more to this entire area than you think. It's not just the nebula itself. So here we have an open star cluster, NGC 1981. Then we have three reflection nebulae here. 1975, 1973, and 1977. And then this bit is separate from the main nebula. This is M43. 
This part is M42, and that's the one we tend to refer to all the time as being the Orion Nebula. And then we've got NGC 1980 star cluster with a little bit of nebulosity. And this is Dave photographing the nova yet again. Now, the, we saw, first saw the nova back in March. Nova means, well, nova means new, new star. But novae themselves are supposed to just disappear after a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, but it's still there. So it's really weird. These photographs are by our old friend Dennis, who lives in Port Mahomek, which is near Tain. This is the Crab Nebula, um, the end, this is a supernova remnant, so the ends of an exploded star, and it's in Taurus. And this is M37, an open star cluster in Auriga. And this is the James Webb Telescope. Would you believe it? And that was taken on the 25th of December. I'm always astonished at how um, launches can occur on the other side of the world, and yet we can end up by seeing them in our skies. The timing is right. Now, Eric spent a while imaging M27, which is a planetary nebula in Belpecula, but the reason he's put this in is because of this tumbling satellite. And you know it's tumbling because you see it, disappears, you see it, and it disappears. And the brighter regions are where the, the reflective, the most reflective areas on the satellite, which is generally the solar panels, the, um, the sun glints off the solar panels, but as the satellite tumbles, then the solar panels or the bright reflective part moves away, it just turns away, so it, there's no reflection. And then of course it comes back as it tumbles yet again. And this is Eric's finished result of the Dumbbell Nebula. And it was his first attempt using a monochrome camera with different color filters and it's turned out really well. Look at all the detail and the structure in that. Now, before you all think, oh, there's moon in the mist, it's not, it's the sun. I had to actually say to Dave, it looks like the moon, but it can't be a full moon because it's the wrong time of the month. He said, no, it's the sun. And look at this photograph here. You can actually see three sunspots in it. No filtering required because of the mist, but it is something you really have to be very careful about if you're planning to do that. And while we're on the subject of the sun, we've got some photographs by Rona Fraser, uh, who is our intrepid adventurer. And she's also a solar eclipse chaser. So she goes everywhere the solar eclipses occur, or as many places as she can. So this time, Antarctica on the 4th of December. Now, she didn't take this photograph because she's one of these people setting up, getting ready for the solar eclipse. And this, this is hers, this is the diamond ring effect. And these have turned out really well, Rona, because they're not easy to do. And this chap was part of the expedition and I think he's a professional photographer. You can see the moon, the Maria in the moon. You can see the little red bits here. We're looking at prominences and we're looking at it's the chromosphere and chroma means red or pink. So that's the sun's lower atmosphere. And then all about it is the corona, the sun's upper atmosphere, which you cannot see unless the sun is blocked out. And it's absolutely beautiful. And it's streaming and all away in the solar wind because it's moving so fast that the sun just cannot keep a hold of it. And you can see how it's entrained by the magnetic field. It's just beautiful, really complex and gorgeous. And of course, when you're looking at the solar eclipse in Antarctica, why not take a trip to the South Pole? So that's what Rona did. A DC-3 aeroplane, so it's uh, got propellers, so it's really a, an old aeroplane, but these are, these are these are always very reliable. 
and this took place on the 11th of December. Rona said it was unpressurized, uncomfortable, and it took four hours to get there. She spent three hours there, and then it was four hours to get back again. And this is what your air hostess looks like on the flight. This is the South Pole Station. Here we have the ceremonial pole, which I'll show in a moment, and the toilet. And Rona was at pains to show me what the toilet was like. <laughs> Not exactly the most wonderful place that you would want to use in their freezing cold conditions. But there you go. I don't think they were allowed to go into the South Pole Station because of COVID regulations. So here she is at the South Pole. And of course, this is the geographical South Pole, not the magnetic South Pole. So that marks the end, the southern end of the rotation pole of the Earth. And this is the ceremonial South Pole, which is surrounded by the flags of the 12 signatories um, of the Antarctic Treaty. And just to prove she was at the South Pole, here we've got South, 89 degrees, 59 minutes, and 995 seconds. So maybe you need to move a little bit more to the left, Rona, and you'll get it bang on. No, I mean, isn't it incredible? So she was right there. And then look at the elevation. This always gets me 9,292 feet. I hadn't realized it was as high as it is. Now, this is known as a South Pole marker. So this is for 2021. And it's lovely because it's got constellations on it. So there's the Southern Cross. That, I think, is Centaurus. That looks like Canis Major with this a triangular head and possibly here Sirius marking its nose or maybe jaws and I think that's Scorpius. Now these markers are put in every year so this one is 2018 and that's because the South Pole is situated on a giant ice sheet like a glacier that flows so these markers move away from the true South Pole as the year goes on. This one is incredible. This marks the time that Amazon reached the South Pole, the first group of people to actually do so, December the 14th, 1911. And this is this year's 2022 South Pole marker. And as Rona said, it's not nearly as pretty as the 2021. Two more photographs. Um, not a particularly brilliant one, but I was pleased that I got this, the uh, double cluster in. But the reason I'm showing this photograph is because here is the Andromeda galaxy, M31. Now, 2.4 million light years away, looks like a tiny speck in the sky. When you use a telescope and a camera, look how magnificent it actually is, and it's just tremendous. And this is a photograph by Connor Cromie, and it's an absolutely stunning image. So well done, Connor. And we've got M110 here and M32 there. So I'll leave you with this. My goodness, that was absolutely fantastic, Pauline. That was so, so, so superb. I'll tell you, I was see all the blue, white super giants in that Canis Major region. Is there any uh -huh. reason why there's so many uh, there? Well, I thought maybe um, it would be uh, perhaps a, a, an area where there was starburst. Have I uh, disconnected? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Good, that's absolutely fine. fine. Uh, oops, I'm just getting myself mixed up there. Okay, um, 
I, well, yeah, I wondered whether this was an area of starbirth recently, which is why you've got a lot of blue supergiants. But if you look at the distances, you've got 3,000 light years away, you've got 400 light years away, and I think there was one at 1,800 light years away. So they're all fairly spaced out, so they can't be uh, from the same region. But it is interesting that you've got a lot of supergiant stars there. Now, I have no idea. I don't know why. No, it's just an observation there. It just seems. Yeah, no, I, I know, but it's, it's quite useful for us. But I mean, if you look at Orion, most of the bright, in fact, all the bright stars in Orion, they're all supergiant stars yeah. um, in some way or other. So, yeah. And they're also extremely bright. So they're, and Orion, of course, has this giant molecular cloud around it, which might include parts of uh, Canis Major. But as I said, you know, some of these are really quite far away, so un are unlikely to be um, associated with it. Yeah, the other one, I love the, I loved your description of the James Webb unfolding and the graphic was superb. But some, they were talking, somebody described it as the origami unfolding. And yeah. I, I can see why it's, uh, it's, it's just, just, just wonderful. Really was. I mean, isn't it absolutely extraordinary what people are able to achieve? And they were so worried that the James Webb wouldn't work, that it wouldn't unfold, that it wouldn't do all the things. And that's, of course, the main reason for all these delays, testing, 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 yeah. trying to get things working. Yeah, um, definitely worth it, though. They're getting great results so far, so, uh, you know, of, of the it's of objectives of the so mission. Far. So it's we just have to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic targets you've given us. I am so keen to have a go at Thor's helmet, but yeah. oh, it really is pretty low. It, I've, it's actually, uh, I think it's going to be the top of trees I'm going to struggle with, but yeah. if it does come up about seven, half past seven, that gives me a give me a few hours, I think. So I'm going to have a go anyway. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the other one to try is see if you can get the white dwarf. That's another one, just at serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have a go. Yeah. I'll have a go. Fantastic, yeah. beautiful astrophotographs. That you've you've shown, and it's amazing, right? And considering all the poor weather we've had for all these months, um, we have got some pretty skilled, enthusiastic amateur astrophotographers in our midst, uh, Pauline. We have indeed. We, we have. have. Okay. Well, thanks, Eric. Guys, that's just about us for tonight. Um, if there's any visitors here tonight, or you know that there's anybody that might be interested in joining our club, you can join our club for the next three months for a mere eight pounds an adult, or. £13 a household, a pound for a junior, or £2.50 for a full-time student. Um, it's all going to be done via Zoom and webcast for now, but hopefully we can all get back together having a chat and a laugh in person this year. I am so, so in need of that. Anyway, um, if you want to get in touch, just contact us by email, website, Facebook, Messenger, and we'll get things moving along for you. Thanks once again for coming along tonight. James, I'm not sure if you're still here. Um, yes, you are. James, thank you once again for that lovely, lovely talk. Really, really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed our club part of it. You'll be very welcome to come back and talk to us again. Or if you're ever up in the area, just pop in and see us. Anyway, people, thank you very much for tonight. Clear skies and keep looking up.